I hope you guys have enjoyed us kind of returning to the Advent candle lighting this year. We've got one more Thursday, Christmas Eve, our Christmas Eve service this year. We've moved that to 4 o'clock, 4 o'clock on Christmas Eve, and I hope you'll be able to join us. This is just a quick question before we get started. Does this sweater make me look fluffy? I just, okay. I just, I just wanted to check that, you know, see if maybe they could slim me down a little bit when they put me on YouTube. You know, favorite Christmas movie? Give me some, give me some thoughts. Christmas Carol, Elf, Muppet Christmas Carol, Die Hard, thank you, there's my answer. There's my answer. Yes, Die Hard is a Christmas movie. Absolutely, Die Hard is a Christmas movie. Lots of great Christmas movies. I hope you're watching some of those with the family. You know, this season just makes us feel good. Now, I want to share something with you that when the kids in, in Pastor Lane were putting together this play, they had no idea, I had no idea what I'd be preaching. Um, and this is just another thing that God puts together for us. The Miracle of the Manger was the title of that play. They have a song in there. They talked about God's timing. We've been talking about miracles for the last three weeks in this sermon series. We, we talked about the miracle of the moment, that God's timing is perfect. And God's timing is always good timing. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean it's our timing. But God's timing is always good timing. And God says, when you wait on me, man, I am going to be good to you. I am going to bring you blessings. And so we begin to understand that I don't know why Jesus came at the moment that he came in time. I, I don't know why God picked that moment. But I do know that the scripture tells us that that was just the right time. And so we've learned about this miracle of the moment and how we want to rely on God's timing for all these things. We talked about the miracle of the message. And we said sometimes, even in this season, or maybe I should say especially in this season, we get too busy. And it's so important for us to slow down, take a deep breath, and listen to what God has to say. Remember, listening is not hearing. We hear a lot of things, but we don't listen to a lot of things. Listening involves time. Listening involves paying attention. And when we listen, especially to God, we are going to be blessed. Look at this passage in Job. If they listen, they will be blessed with prosperity throughout their lives. If they listen they pay attention to me, if they give me time. Because when we listen, we begin to get understanding. So we've seen the miracle of the moment. We've seen the miracle of the message. Today we're going to look at the miracle of the method, the plan. Why did God do it the way he did? And if you don't understand the miracle of the method, you're not going to be able to see the miracle of the message or the miracle of the moment. So when we understand this method, we understand that this was a plan that God had before time began. This was God's unchanging plan to bring that baby Jesus to this earth at this time to save us from our sins. This was the sign. Remember how we talked about that last week? Sometimes it's helpful to have more than just words. It's helpful to have a picture. So when we begin to see the signs, we begin to understand that this was God's plan, now we begin to see the miracle of the method. Why did God do it the way he did, and what part do I have in that? So let's pray, and we'll take a look at that today. Father, thank you so much. What a joy it is. What a joy it is to celebrate like a child. What a joy it is to celebrate with the joy in the faces of these young people. What a joy it is to celebrate that you came as a child. Father, help us become more like little children and just to trust and believe those things that you have to say for us. Help us to listen to the message so that we would never miss the moment. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So as we look around here, as we have people on YouTube, each of us probably has a different method for buying Christmas gifts. I, I know absolutely, and you know who you are, that some of you started in June. 
and you began to buy, I, I see husbands looking at wives going, yep, you started to buy Christmas gifts in June. There are others of you who haven't started yet at all. You probably won't start until next Tuesday or Wednesday. Right, Bill? <laughs> so what's the method to that? The, the, the method means a procedure to accomplish something. A procedure to accomplish something. Now, for you, especially for those of you who haven't started yet, it works for you. I may not understand that, your wife may not understand that, but it works for you. And sometimes when we don't understand something, but it works, we would say there is a method to our madness. Now for God, in sending Jesus at just the right time, we may not understand that plan, but it worked. And it wouldn't be a method to God's madness, it would be a method to his love. There was a method to God's love. Look with me at John 3.16. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. His beloved, the thing he loved more than anything else. Now God gave. Now I want you to understand something. The word world in Greek is cosmos. Now look at the definition of cosmos. It is the ungodly multitude. It is men alienated from God. It is people who are hostile to the cause of Christ. So let's get more personal. When he says world, who is he talking about? Who? Us, right? You and me. You and me were a part of that. We may not be a part of that now, but you and me were a part of that. I don't want you to miss that. We were the ungodly multitude. We were those hostile to the cause of Christ. See, if you don't believe that, you won't believe you need a Savior. And we all need a Savior. So don't just put, well, boy, yeah, those people, yeah, our neighbors, man, they are really the ungodly multitude. They don't even have Christmas lights up this year. <laughs> so don't miss that. We are the ungodly multitude. We are the people who were alienated from God. We are the people who are hostile to the cause of Christ. Now think in your mind, can I say this in church? Think, think in your mind someone that you don't really like very much. All got a picture? Can okay, now imagine that person that you don't like very much, that you're kind of alienated from, that you're kind of hostile to. Now imagine that particular person, let's say they were dying. Let's say they needed some kind of a transplant, and the only person who could provide that transplant for them was one of your children. And in order to provide that transplant for them, in order to provide the blood that that person needed, who you are alienated from, who you are hostile to, the only way they could live was for your child to give all the blood they had, and your child would die. Anybody in here doing that? And yet that's precisely what God did for us. God did that precisely for us. So I want you to understand that we probably wouldn't have done it that way. That probably wouldn't have been our plan. That probably would not have been our method but it was God, and it works. Look at 1 John chapter 4. God's love has been revealed. How did God reveal his love? He sent his son so we might live. He sent his son so we might live. So the only thing we need to see God's love is that Jesus came. That's how he revealed his love. He revealed his love to us in that way. He loved us and sent his son to be the, big word, propitiation for our sins. 
Propitiation. Big Greek word, real important Greek word. Halasmos in the Greek. Listen to this entire definition. That by which it becomes consistent with God's character to pardon and bless the sinner. Stop. God's character is not to punish you. God's character is not to curse you. God's character is not to put sickness and disease on you. God's character is not someone who comes and wants to be, make you suffer all your life. We have misunderstood God's character. In fact, at one point in the Bible, it tells us that God's wrath is a strange thing to him. It's not normal. It's consistent with God's character to pardon and bless the sinner. It renders it consistent. Now, what renders it consistent? Jesus is dying for us to pay the price, to be the sacrifice, for God to exercise his love towards sinners. Remember that person that you are alienated from, that you are hostile to? It literally means to make favorable, and it specifically includes the idea of dealing with God's wrath towards sinners. What does? Jesus. Jesus. That was the method. Again, you and I probably aren't going to do it that way. We're not going to sacrifice our children for someone that we don't even like. Someone that we're hostile to. <sighs> that doesn't make sense to me. It doesn't make sense to me. That I was hostile towards God. I was ungodly. I was alienated from him. And that God is still going to send his beloved son to die on the cross so that I might live. Doesn't make sense sense. I don't know if it's supposed to make sense. I don't know if it can make sense. I don't know if we can understand that kind of love. You know, in Isaiah 55, God says, my ways and my thoughts are higher than your thoughts. They're not the same as yours. Now, interestingly, when you read that passage in context, which I've put for you in your notes, God's ways and God's thoughts are to freely forgive. That's why they're not our ways and our thoughts, because our thoughts aren't to freely forgive. But God's are. Romans chapter 11 says it's impossible for us to understand God's decisions and his ways. It's imp I, I, can't, I can't sit up here and tell you why God did it this way. I can't. I don't understand it. It's a miracle. And it's the miracle of the method to bring us the message so we never miss a moment. Corey Ten Boom said, Who can add to Christmas? The perfect motive is love, and the perfect gift is Jesus. You know, there's a lot of us who will get gifts at Christmas and we'll be upset. <laughs> we will be frustrated. We will be disappointed. Folks, you've already got the perfect gift perfect gift was Jesus and the motive was love. So this method I, I don't understand. And it's a love so great that Jesus would even come when he knew people would not love him in return. Now think with me again for that person that you really don't like, you're alienated from and you're hostile to. Think with me a minute if, if there was something that you could do and I I won't even go so far as giving your child. But if there was something that you could do, something that you could sacrifice in order to repair and restore that relationship, in order for them not to be alienated from you anymore, in order for you not to be hostile with them, imagine if there was something that you could do that meant an awful lot, that cost you an awful lot, and they still wouldn't love you they still would be hostile to you, even though you've already given them that gift. Would you do it? God did it anyway. Even though he knew that these people would still love the darkness rather than the light. God knew that they would do that, and yet he still gave. Jesus says, 
If they hate you, don't be surprised. They hated me first. How in the world can you hate Jesus? How in the world can you hate the perfect expression of God's love? And yet he came anyway even though he knew that they would not respond to his love in kind. They would not respond back with love. So what did God do? He loved them anyway. Oops, wait a minute, let me rephrase that. He loved us anyway. He loved us anyway. And guess what else he did? He freely forgave us. Even though we were hostile to the cause of Christ, even though we were alienated from God. Now, just think of your children again, those of you who have children. Think of someone close to you if you don't. Are you going to be friends with someone who is openly hostile to one of your children? <laughs> and yet God said, you know what? I'm going to love you anyway, and I am going to freely forgive you. Go back to that passage in Isaiah 55. He will forgive generously far beyond anything you could imagine. Wow. See, one of the first things we have to do to understand that we need a Savior is recognize our sin. Because there's a lot of people in our world who think they are good, godly people, and they don't know Jesus. No, they are hostile to the cause of Christ. The reason why the law was given was to show us our sin, to show us all of the ways that we fell short. The reason the law was given was to point us to Jesus, because he was our only hope. Our only hope. So this God, knowing that we were openly hostile to his son, knowing that we were alienated from him, knowing that some people would continue to love darkness and not the light, knowing that people would hate his son, loved us anyway. And he forgave us anyway. And I don't want you to miss these two verses in 2 Corinthians 5 and 1 John 1, 1 John 2. He forgave the sins of the whole world. Folks, there is not a single person in this world who has not been forgiven of their sins. Doesn't mean we're all going to heaven. Because you and I still have to believe and receive that gift, John 1, 12. But there is not a single sin of commission Something that we've done that prevents us from going to heaven. Why? Jesus has forgiven it all. The only thing that prevents you or I or anybody else watching us in this entire world from going to heaven is unbelief. Go back and read John 3.16. Read it all the way through verse 36. And you will see who's condemned and who's not. And it's people who reject Jesus. That's it. So whatever you came in here with today... You know, whether you're a thief, whether you're a liar, whether you're immoral, whether you're a murderer, whether you worry a lot, whether you have doubt and fear, whatever you came in here with today, it's been forgiven. Why are you carrying it? That's why there's no guilt, shame, or condemnation, because the sins have already been taken care of. Now, that does not mean we go out and sin more. That is one of the greatest misconceptions of grace. Romans chapter 6. So, since we live under grace, should we continue in sin? Absolutely not, Paul says. No, when we begin to understand what Jesus has already done, that's when we are free to live a life of righteousness. And you know what? That's a miracle. <laughs> this method that God came up with to send his son to pay the price for our sins, that's a miracle. And I don't understand it. You know what else is a miracle? He chose people to be involved in sharing this method. Guys like Abram, guys like David, guys like Joshua, guys like Paul. 
They were chosen. God chose those people in order to share the method of how God was going to save us. <laughs> That's a miracle. You think he could have used somebody better than us. But wait a minute. There's even a bigger miracle. It's not just guys like Abraham and David and Joshua and Paul. Guess who else he chose? It's an even bigger miracle. He chose you and I. God chose us. to be the method for sharing this message to the world. Well, I'm not a pastor. I'm just a, I'm just a whatever. I'm just a teacher. I'm just a mom. I, I'm just a police officer. I'm just a lawyer. I'm just a rancher. No. You're a child of the king. You're God's beloved. He chose you and I to be part of the method of, of telling the world about Jesus. Look at these scriptures. You did not choose me. I chose you. I appointed you. He chose us in him. Look at this in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. I'm going to read the whole thing. It's not all up here. God has given us this task. He gave us this wonderful message. We are Christ's ambassadors. God is making his appeal through us. We speak this message of reconciliation. Now again, that's probably not how we would have done it. I don't know if I would choose people who are hostile to me and who are alienated from me and who are against me to present the very message for this. I don't think that's the way I would have done it. Thank goodness I'm not in charge. Because the miracle of God's method, it may not make sense to us, but it works. And you might want to say, well, Pastor, I just I I don't know and understand all this theology stuff. I don't have the ability to do that. Folks, you've got to get past that. It is not about your ability. It is about your availability. Amen? Amen? It is not about your ability. It's about your availability. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 1. God in His wisdom. This is God's wisdom. This is how God said, I've chosen to do this. And if you believe like I do that God's pretty smart... This is a good thing to go with. God, in his wisdom, used our foolish preaching to save those who believe. Man, you can bless me if you leave here today. And pastor, that message was foolish. Uses my foolish preaching. Uses your foolish preaching to save people who believe. This foolish plan of God... Again, would we have chosen to do it this way? No. We just said this is foolishness to use us to talk about the Savior of the world? Come on. We are frail. We are broken. I almost said we are sinners, but we're not anymore, are we? We're saints. We're saints. You are never called a sinner again after you receive Jesus. You are called a saint which means most holy one. So don't ever buy this thing, even under grace. Well, I'm just a sinner saved by grace. You were a sinner, but once you're saved by grace, you are now a saint. You are a most holy one. You're not a sinner anymore. Over 70 times in the New Testament you are called a saint. So don't buy the lie that you're a sinner. Why? Because your identity produces your behavior. Your identity produces your behavior. So if you just believe you're a sinner, guess what you're going to produce? Sin. But when you believe you're a saint, what are you going to produce? Righteousness. So in his foolish plan, it's wiser than the wisest of human plans, God called you. God called me. 
God called you. He chose things the world considers foolish in order to shame those who think they are wise. He chose things that are powerless to shame those who are powerful. He chose things despised by the world, things counted as nothing at all. Do you ever feel foolish and powerless and despised? God chose you. And he chose you to be the method to share this message. Pastor Mark Deaver says, We do not fail in our evangelism if we present the gospel and the person is not saved. We fail only when we don't present the gospel at all. Folks, don't let the devil scare you. <laughs> The devil wants to convince you you're not worthy, you don't have enough of a testimony, you don't have enough knowledge, you don't have enough wisdom, you don't have enough compassion. Just share the good news of what God has done for you. <laughs> you don't have to figure out the book of Revelation <laughs> in order to witness to somebody. You don't even have to know all the books that are in the Bible to witness to somebody. Just share the good news of what God has done for you. It's all he's asking us. Luke, John, 1 John, go back to your family, tell them everything God has done for you. The woman left her jar, she ran to the village telling everyone about Jesus. Declare what you have seen and heard so you may have fellowship with us. You do not have to have a theological degree. In fact, it's better if you don't. <laughs> Just Tell people what God has done for you. You are the only one who can share your story. You're the only one. You're the only one who can share your story. And that's what God wants us to do. He has chosen us to be part of the method. That's, that is a miracle that God chose us to be a part of that. To think that God would want us to share in this is absolutely unbelievable. And despite what you may think, honestly, you have beautiful feet. Romans chapter 10. How can they believe without hearing? How can they hear unless someone tells them? For beautiful are the feet of those who share good news. Take your shoes off this Christmas. Be part of the method that God has chosen. Let the miracle of the message and the miracle of the moment come out of your mouth as you tell people the good things that God has done for you. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much. What a joy today has been to share life with family. Thank you for all that you have done for us. Thank you for what you have shown us on this day. We just thank you for a foolishness this week a foolishness to share all of the good things that you have done for us. Thank you, Father, that this was part of your plan, that we were a part of your plan to share this good news. For it's in his name we pray. Amen. I got one more video to show you. And again, like I told you at the beginning of the message, not planned. If you remember these videos, the first video was about a little girl who was hoping for her dad to come back. The first candle was hope. The second video was about a guy preparing for getting the bed for his dog. The second candle was about preparation. The third video was about joy. And you remember the joy on the old man's face when his family came and shared Christmas with him? This video is about love, and that's the candle that the Aiken family lit today. So again, that's all God's doing. But sh let me show you one more video before we dismiss.